Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sirona Abu Akar. Um, I'll be uh, moderating the panel this eve, and I'm really excited to do so. Um, so we are at, it starts here, um, and artist duties to reflect on the times. So without further ado, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, so I'd like to start us off with a quote, actually. Um, and it's the, the person who said this is the inspiration for this panel. An artist's duty is to reflect on the times. I think this is true of painters, sculptors, musicians. It's their choice, but I choose to reflect the times and situations which I find myself in. That, to me, is my duty. And at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people, black and white, know this. That is why we are so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country, or it will not be molded or shaped at all anymore. So I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect on the times? That, to me, is the definition of an artist. And that, of course, is Nina Simone in an interview in the late 1960s. So today, we have with us four artists who will take us through their cultural production practices and politic politics in a discussion on our times. Um, so before we go ahead and I introduce each one of uh, the artists here today, I would like to go ahead and go over some uh, housekeeping rules for us. So we do have some tech background during the live panel event. Um, so anyone in the audience, if you have any queries, please send them in the Zoom chat and they will be uh, addressed. Um, this is being recorded as well. And we do recommend, as in the chat um, is said, we recommend watching this webinar in the full screen experience. Um, there is BSL present as well. We have Eze and Nakasai. Thank you so much. And we have Jay as well who will be our graphic note taker and document the panel visually for us. Um, and thank you to everyone who's playing a part in making this space happen, um, including our speakers. So I will go ahead and introduce our first artist. We have Jacob V. Joyce. Jacob is an artist, educator, and researcher with a community-facing practice that amplifies historical and nourishes new queer anti-colonial narratives. Their work is grounded in an Afrofuturist world building and includes workshops, murals, illustrations, and performance art. And each of the speakers will talk about their practices and anything that they'd like for, to share with us today. So thank you so much for joining us, Jacob. Um, and you have 10 minutes. Hi, thank you so much, Sorona. Um, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here today and it was nice to have an opportunity to think about the ways that my work does connect to the arms trade um, because I think it's, it's one of those issues that I think a lot of people find quite abstract and I think if you ask a lot of people how they feel about the arms trade they would, they would have like negative things to say about it but it feels very alien and hard to really imagine how we can connect to that. So a lot of my work focuses around education. I work a lot with schools, I work a lot with youth centres, I work a lot with murals which are close to schools or education departments within galleries. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of my work um, to give you an idea of how artwork can be a, a gateway to help communities contextualize systemic oppression and develop a practice of challenging um, hegemony. Because Sarona said in my introduction that my work is um, about amplifying um, historical and nourishing new queer anti-colonial um, struggles. Um, but what that means is that my work often is about creating a space where people can challenge power, um, where people can think about the power, the, the systemic power that is present in their lives and how they might critically engage with it. I'm trying to speak really slowly as well for the BSL interpreter. If it's my speech sounds a bit different if you've heard me speak before. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to start off by talking, I wanted to start off by talking about um, 
a resource I made for the Tate Modern um, and Tate Britain um, during my residency there in 2019. Um, so during my residency, I was working with two schools each day that I was there um, and doing workshops for young people. And one of the workshops that I developed, it was more of a warm-up exercise, actually. I would ask children to find the most boring piece of artwork in the tape. And once they'd located the most boring piece of artwork, then we would stand around it and very, very quietly and very, very sarcastically, um, we would start to say, wow. And the wows would get louder and louder each time, so it starts off, wow. 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 And I'm not going to scream because um, Amina, um, one of our panelists has said that they've got a problem with their ear today, so it's disrespectful to do that. But the aim is that we would get louder and louder until we were howling, screaming. Um, wow. And everyone would be like, why are those children making so much noise? Um, and now that resource is available at the Tate. You can, you, you, um, at the desk, you can ask for a resource called HS for Howling. A yellow piece of paper and it says you've got permission to make noise um but the reason why i talk about that piece is because um for me it's important to give children an introduction to protest um an introduction to claiming space and an introduction to challenging institutional power because the tate modern and the tate britain specifically the tate uh britain is an intensely colonial space, and especially for black and brown children um, going into that space, there is very little representation of black and brown people apart from, you know, images of um, of slaves dancing um, in some of the historical works, which paint a really warped picture of messing up. No, my internet's okay. Cool. You're back. Okay, sorry. Well, what, what I was saying is that the, yeah, the Tate is a, is a racist institution in a lot of ways. Um, the history of the gallery and also the way it's curated um, have a long way to go. Um, and I mentioned that piece because it's just a kind of fun exercise that I do through my artwork to try and encourage people to start thinking from a young age about how we can challenge systemic power. Another workshop that I do is the Reverse Berlin Conference. Um, where I have a giant map of Europe, which is um, on laminated paper, so um, thick laminated paper, so it can be used again and again. And it's a map of Europe split onto um, 24 different sheets of paper. The group have to, whether they're children or adults, they have to put together the map collectively, and then they have to redesign, specifically focusing around England, redesign Europe. And what I ask people to I give people the history of the Berlin Conference. So in eighteen in eighteen uh, ninety five or eighteen ninety three, I should know this off the top of my head. I normally do, but I guess we've been a lot down a while. Um, there was a conference in Berlin where European countries came together and decided on how they would carve up the um, the continent of Africa. Um, and who would colonize which parts. And I use this as an example of how historically people have used mapping. Jacob? God, don't do this to me, internet. You're yeah, back? For like five seconds, yes, and now you're back. Okay, great. Um, how people have used mapping, thank you, um, in quite a violent way. And also to introduce people to the concept of abolition, because abolition requires us to kind of clear the map in a way and to, to think, what would it be like if um, we started again from scratch? So what I ask children to do is to redesign Britain, and I ask them to think about institutions, schools, universities, hospitals, statues. Um, do we even need schools? Do we even need um, universities? Um, what would you have instead? And then at the end of the workshop, it's a time to look at the world that we've built and to think about how we've, e we've ended up replicating some of the structures of white supremacy, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and always militarism as well. That always comes up. Um, and a final piece of work that I wanted to talk about 
um, briefly is a resource that I've made um, in collaboration with an artist called Rudy Lowe, um, which is called Sweet Rebellion. And it's also available, um, if you go on my Instagram, in my bio, there's a link so you can download it. Um, it's aimed at children in year seven and eight, but it could be used by anyone really. Um, and it's about thinking, it's about looking at five key figures in the history <clears throat> of slavery's abolition. All, all five of them are black people from the Caribbean or from Africa um, who worked in different ways to end uh, cattle slave, chattel slavery. Um, and the resource gives you all these, these historical examples of these different people and invites young people um, to, first of all, to collectively decide for themselves what colonialism means by looking at the history, um, to decide for themselves what other key terms mean, um, and then to create comics um, where they look at these, these, these characters and they think, okay, so Nanny of the Maroons, she, she resisted slavery by kind of strategizing in this way, by running away and then creating her own um, town in Jamaica. So, um, you know, so uh, Sam Sharp um, decided to uh, organize strikes, labor strikes and these kind of strikes. Okay, so um, Oluda Aquiano um, wrote, wrote his story and his story was the thing that was, was useful. So I was asking young people to, to, to think about these characters and then to make a comic about how they would use these strategies to address oppression in their day-to-day -day lives. So I know this panel is called um, An Artist's Responsibility to Reflect the Times, but for me, I think a really important thing that has to be considered when we're reflecting the times is the way that the, the, the past is erased again and again, and it's, it's as if we have to start from scratch each time. And I think there is so much work that's been done um, by people in, in, in all different um, forms of activism that needs to be connected to. So, yeah, I, I hope that my work will give young people a, a toolkit to, to start thinking about how to challenge systemic power and, and hopefully makes conversations about the arms trade seem a little bit less daunting and, and abstract. Um, and I think that's probably been about 10 minutes. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, I think what's really amazing is to hear how your practice aims at one, this idea and material um, practice of redesigning or reimagining collective memory building, um, but also as well providing historical examples of, of resistance and applying it um, to the contemporary landscape as a way of practicing political like imagining, which I think is is definitely something we could all use now. <laughs> um, but I'll go ahead and hand it over to Toby. I would like to introduce them, first of all. Toby Alexandra Falade is our next artist. Um, Toby is a Nigerian British visual artist. Um, creating original oil paintings, silk screen prints, and bronze uh, sculptures, engaging with narratives of modern Black British life and dialogues of African and post-colonial contexts. She creates paintings using methods of collaging, placing different images from family photographs in Nigeria next to each other in order to build new fictional, fictional excuse me, narratives. These dis this distinctive manipulation of materials and the techniques she uses to approach these subjects allow her to join worlds together through her artworks. She frequently uses herself as a model within her artworks to, to explore narratives of identity and self, and her term uh, shadow self refers to a version of her that she imagines has continued living on, in Nigeria after she was physically divorced from her country of origin and moved to the UK, she thinks of this version as her other. Toby lives and works in Liverpool and in London. And without further ado, Toby, you have 10 minutes. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you for the introduction, Serena. Um, I'm really happy to be here and speak about my work um, at this event. Um, 
So I think that my personal history of being born in Nigeria and moving to the UK at seven years old is really kind of the basis of all my work. I think this informs who I am now um, and it informs the work that I make. And being born in Nigeria, like I mentioned, um, I grew up there and I grew up in places that weren't um, part of like my family's kind of heritage. So I've always kind of felt like um, kind of othered in a way, even in like a country where people look like me. And then moving to the United the United Kingdom as well. Um, I lived in places like London and Liverpool and in Rochdale. And being like one of the only um, black students in my classrooms, I've always felt othered as, again. So in my works, I try and create kind of like a, a family of people that look like me. And that's like one of the reasons I use myself as a model within my work to create multiple me's um, that can kind of tell the story of, of my life experiences of like moving continents, you know, learning new cultures and kind of feeling like I have to assimilate. Um, and a, a work that I kind of realized I was doing this, kind of making multiple versions of myself, is called Mirror Me. And in this work, it's like a oil, a really large oil painting. And it has um, a figure of myself sitting on a chair. And in a corner of this oil painting is a silk screen print of a photograph of my dad and I um, in primary school in Nigeria. And in this um, screen print, I'm wearing like traditional dress. Um, and I also, in my work, talk a lot about memory and um, kind of the feelings that I felt when I was a child and living in this different country. And also I have mentioned, I haven't been back to Nigeria since I left um, when I was seven. So I'm a little bit obsessed with it in that kind of way. And um, I'm really interested in the idea of like home going, homecoming and the return. And in this um, photograph that I talked about, um, we're wearing like Nigerian clothes. And I just remember how that made me feel to be like connected to my culture. Um, and in more recent works, I've actually kind of responded to the idea of like colonialism um, in Nigeria, which is very kind of still present in um, our politics, I would say. Um, and I made this bronze mask called My Other, and it's um, um, molded from my face. And in this bronze mask, I kind of want to speak to the bronze works at the British Museum, which have been like looted um, by the British, and they're not in the original country, like in Nigeria or other parts of Africa. So I decided to make my own in a way to kind of reclaim it. And, and to me, that like bronze mask is a really like an investigation into like being from a different place and having this vast history and then um, the ideas of like imperialism and colonialism kind of taking over and claiming things as their own. Um, and in more recent works, um, more recent paintings, I have explored the idea of like others and my other and having multiple selves by having three different versions of me in one painting. Um, in a recent work I have called We Will Come Find You, I have an image of myself as a young child um, from my passport that I used to enter this country with. And then I have an image of myself now kind of looking at that younger image of me. And then I have another image of me which is upside down to kind of speak about a reflection or a a duplicate um, so these are the kind of themes that I'm exploring in my work and a lot of the narratives I like them to be quite personal about me about my family I use um, photo albums from my families that my family has brought from Nigeria over to the UK and I kind of make collages with these um, photos and merge them with photos that I've taken now and I kind of call this merging my worlds together. Um, and it's a way for me to kind of 
exist in all my different realms of being like Nigerian, being from Liverpool, living in different places, different cities, and basically trying to bring those all into one place. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, that's just incredible. I remember looking at your work actually just from, from, you know, when I was told that you would be on this panel and it really struck me, I think, the, the practice of layering, but also of this constant theme of almost um, self-reflection and exploration in kind of a very material turn, but also as well, I think, um, you know, this theme of coming and returning is very present, I think, just personally for me as being Palestinian. So I definitely feel that through your work as well. Um, and those questions that come up when I was looking, when listening to you now and, and seeing your work was, what does it mean to leave a home? Or rather, what does it, what does it mean to have a home leave you? And what does home look like? Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'll go ahead and move on now to our next uh, speaker, Amina. Um, Amina Atik. She is an award-winning Yemeni Scouse poet, performance artist, and activist. She is currently writing her first one-woman script, Broken Biscuits, to explore her grandmother's 1970s Yemeni Scouse household to untangle what it means to be British. In 2020, she produced a documentary titled Unheard Voices, commissioned by Dada Fest, capturing the stories of Yemeni shopkeepers in Liverpool. She is currently a remote writer in residence with Queensland Poetry Festival and Metal Southend. Amina, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Your 10 minutes is here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, it's lovely hearing from Jacob and Toby. Um, so I'm honored to be here. Um, I think it's only right to begin um, at the age of 15. Um, at the age of 15, I was um, unfairly convicted uh, and received a three-year criminal record. Um, and the reason why that happened is we did go to a very racist and Islamophobic uh, area uh, in Liverpool. Um, and what happened, which is interesting for me, that I only understood today at the age of 25, was the privilege of a bystander um, and I never really realized it because I thought I was always angry at the bus driver the one who slayed the racist um, prejudice um, and I'd confronted him uh, verbally and physically as a 15 year old teenager but what was interesting is I'd never seen the perspective of the bystander because it was the bystander who would basically put in the claim against me. It wasn't the bus driver because the bus driver knew what he did was wrong. And for me, 10 years later, after joining the campaign of the Anthony Walker Foundation here in Liverpool, they made me realise that it was actually not my fault. So for 10 years, I've actually blamed myself and was really embarrassed to say I had a criminal record for three years. Um, but the good news is, um, because I thought I had a criminal record for my whole life, I became an artist. Um, I told my mother to buy me a camera at the age of 16. At 17, I received my first commission, and since then, I've not really had a 9-to-5 job. I've been exploring art as a medium. So I'm going to start with this piece um, that I did for the Anthony Walker Foundation, and it's called My School Bus Stop. My school bus stop is hide and seek behind the glass shield. We race to the school gate sucking on sour lollipops with our mouths inked in blue. The attendance officer marks us late. It was a promise we made to the girls to leave no one behind. This playground is war, turned cold, and the hijab tightened itself. I told my mother I need running shoes. She said, what for? I said, I need... I need legs that can run faster. So I carried my heart to the thump of his feet, growing louder on the double-decker stairs. And he stood tall, standing, chanting Beladen headlines and curry smell. And I sat small, hiding behind the Metro newspaper in a story that looked like mine. So I stuck out, stuck out my foreign tongue. The passengers pulled sad faces, hugging the predator with his fist in my face, and a bystander choked on its privilege. 
called in the police and I was saved, shackled to the prison gates, and they held my narrative hostage. So I grew a lioness in my scars and just threw my foreign face and the salam alaikum to my predators. Um, so I thought it would really, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think it would have been um, only important to start here because it only took me 10 years to say this publicly. Um, so no, it was not my fault. And would I defend myself again? Yes. The only biggest regret that I didn't have was that someone to teach me my rights at the age of 15. Because um, the way I was even checked and um, stripped by police officers, I, I was even told that was even actually wrong. The way I was mocked in the interview room, I was told that was wrong 10 years later. So the reason I'm here today, even though this took me 10 years, I knew that there was fire in my stomach to bring change, but I just did not know how to do it. And the only way I could have done it is through poetry, because I knew that that's it. I have an audience, I have a stage, but what is, and there's three things that I've realized over 10 years is the power that I have but also the power that I don't have because sometimes people don't realize that activists are sometimes one people and you know or artists are only one it's only a one person job sometimes and um you know so it's about also looking for allyship because there's certain types of people in our society that have the power and sometimes we don't my poem can't change waves but I know someone else that can maybe be inspired to create new policies and um, also look for an opportunity so i've always said what is it that i can do in this time so something's happened um currently so i look for that opportunity so it's about hijacking our opportunity and finding ways to say well there's an opportunity for me here now how do i use that to benefit the story that i'm trying to tell but also who am i helping or bringing change in this in this process and also looking for potential it's not about creating art today and it, it's becoming an entertainment piece i always say to everyone i'm not here to sing rainbows and clouds you know the art that i i'm trying to it's not it comes from pain and it comes from a certain type of struggle that you know not my struggle but sometimes the struggle that you want to bring but you just can't say it in words or articulate it so I can happily say that poetry is my little baby, <laughs> but it also saved me. Um, it also saved me from many things. <laughs> um, so uh, as my bio states, as a Yemeni scouser, um, when I went into the poetry uh, stage, I was known as the Muslim writer, which I understand. I am visibly Muslim. Um, do you know what I mean? I'm not a penguin. So and <laughs> what happened was, um, you know, I just thought you know i'm not just muslim you know you know i'm i'm quite passionate um i can be hilarious if you sit with me over an orange juice and you can have your beer or whatever but um and i just thought what can i do to change that label because at the end of the day i'm proud of my faith and it, it's a part of me visibly uh, so what i did is i someone came up to me and said are you that yemeni scouts writer and I've never seen them combinations together. It's like it's like having a chocolate cake with a cheesecake, you know. And I just thought, can they even be together? You know, I've never understood that these two identities can be part of one. And I did. I took ownership of that. I changed it on every bio. I even introduced myself. And I was like, I am the Yemeni Scouts. And you know what's interesting? Two years ago, I went to a, a white middle class networking event very successful women across the Northwest. And they even created a hashtag on LinkedIn, Yemeni Scouts, without even me indicating that they should. <laughs> and that was really powerful for me because it's not about me. It's about visibility, it's about representation. And for me, that was really important because as a Muslim, the, the, there's a lot of negative connotations that come with that. And I feel like sometimes that's what delays the process. In, in, in a lot of my Muslim peers that express that they think that they can't explore their art form in a safe space as being Muslim, especially female Muslims. Um, so going on to like talking a bit more about Yemen, um, I came in contact with the campaign against the arms trade when, um, when I realised that my writing and my art is no longer about me 
and it's about people that I can use my f platform to vocalize their um, what they want to say, but acknowledging the privilege that I have. Uh, but also remembering that not to hijack other people's spaces when the, when they are, are able to. And when the war began in Yemen, um, it took me a year to express how I felt about that because I'd already expressed my first poem at the age of 14 about Palestine and then it went on to the Arab Spring. And then, But when it came to your own home, I think it makes it even more difficult to express that because it's like, and you even start to deny it. I even started to deny it now. It's not happening. It'll blow over. And what's interesting, it's six years now, and I think Campaign Against the Armed Trades and the work that they do with Yemeni activists um, in Yemen is really important work because what, what that did is looking at who has the power. And that's not saying that Yemeni people don't have the power, but we also have to acknowledge that they are being censored in Yemen by both sides, not just by Saudi Arabia, but also the Houthi rebels. They're not allowed to express themselves through artistic practices of their political um, rights. Um, they are being killed. So I, I have told even my friends, don't encourage Yemeni activists on the ground to do what you think that they should do. But also remember that the risk, that, that will ha the implications that will have on their life. So it's really important to know the ethical boundaries here as well when we're connecting with activists across, across the world. Um, and I think for me, um, it's about power shifting the narrative. Um, so going back to the whole Yemeni scouts, um, for me growing up as you know, as a 25 year old artist, and I'm still learning. I still think that I'm an amateur in in everything. But I think one thing that I have to say is, is, is about being brave and taking risks. Um, art, the artistic and creative world is is a very lonely place. It really is. And um, we might look like we are very brave and courageous and artistic, but we you have to also acknowledge that we're, what we're doing physically, mentally and emotionally is a lot. Because we're taking a lot from, you know, especially activism and art, it's a lot emotionally and physically. And, um, and I just hope that the world, especially in the pandemic, values the artistic world even more because as well as it does entertain, it's been your Netflix binge for the past year, there are also artists who are still continuing that conversation behind the pandemic because war has not stopped. People are still going through war and the pandemic. People are still going through, you know, um, certain types of slavery around the world um, and there is a pandemic. Um, and I think this is all just a distraction. Um, as well so people are taking advantage of that power um, but I'm just going to end it with this idea is as an artist and an activist and I'm going to ask everyone in the audience what is your purpose you know is it to win or is it to be right and I ask myself every single day when I wake up why am I here am I here because I want to win or is it I want to be right or sometimes it's neither um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to finish with the short piece and this is called Golden Eagle Sorry, be a self interpreter. I was dead quick. <laughs> okay, I'm a dark horse. Beating down the door somewhere, my childhood escaped the streets, etching three syllables of my name beneath the old city of Babel, Yemen. And a woman dressed in black found me shackled to the gates. It was my mother chewing on her ruby passport. It's time to leave. And goodbyes past the northern valleys, greeted the southern blue waters, unlocking the fisherman's Red Sea, and the colony crown reeked of death, buried in my foreign blood. And martyrs will meet life, and justice will dance on the head to snakes. And it turned cold quickly over the Mediterranean, because this Yemeni girl sings British anthems between her terrace walls, and I lost a part of me, because I forgot the taste of my mother's milk with her nipple gritted between my teeth, and I taught my mother how to speak English, translating her hospital letters because the cold is eating her bones. And is a heartbreak worth to be torn between my two homes if my racist neighbour daydreams our women in two-piece sets, golden headbands and white polished toes in the sand because I deserve my honour.
and I lost a part of me in this dining room, learning to use a knife and fork, because we don't eat Sunday roast fish and chips, porky pie, or go to the pubs, because I like my fingers and my food, and coffee before I sleep. But I lost a part of me in this corner shop, Grandad left selling mocha beans, broken dreams, broken biscuits for half a penny. Because this year many girls sing British anthems and British bombs between her terrace walls. But she wears home and this dress still fits perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amina. Um, I'm, I'm kind of speechless, actually. <laughs> um, I want to thank you as well for sharing that experience at the start. Um, that must have been, I can't imagine the kind of um, anger and, and vulnerability that must have shaken you to your core. So I want to thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and it really makes me think of um, the idea of criminality and the, con and the idea of... Um, defense, who defines criminality and whose defense are we centering when we're doing this kind of work. Um, and it really kind of bringing it back to what Toby mentioned about one of her work about the bronze works in the British Museum. That's criminal. But what is happening with that? Um, and I think as well, one, one last thing before I hand it off to our last speaker, the what's really what I found really powerful um, is how you're constantly grappling with the, with the with the material, but also the the ethical questions of of allyship and solidarity. How do we use our 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 spaces and our and our efforts to to show solidarity, but also knowing um, how to also um, know know our space and, and provide a platform. So thank you so much for that. Um, and lastly. We move on to Nadine Block. Um, Nadine is an outside the box activist and po artist, political com community organizer, strategic nonviolent actionista, and the training director for Beautiful Trouble. Her work explores the potent intersection of art and politics, where creative cultural resistance is not only effective political action, but also a powerful way to reclaim agency over our own lives, fight oppressive systems, and invest in our communities, um, all the while having more fun on the other side. In addition to contributing content to the books Beautiful Trouble, Beautiful Rising, and We Are Many, Reflections on Movement Strategy from Occupation to Liberation, she's the author of The Manual's Education and Training, and nonviolent resistance, and the co-author of SNAP, an action guide to synergizing nonviolent action and peace building. So thank you so much for joining us, Nadine. Um, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Your 10 minutes are here. Thank you so much, Sarona. Thank you, uh, the Campaign Against Arms Trade, and thank you, uh, fellow artists, Jacob, Toby, and Amina, for sharing your work and your stories. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been involved. Um, with political creative activism for almost four decades. And I'm speaking to you today from like the heart of the beast, the belly of the beast in Washington, DC. Um, I work these days, um, I am an artist. I do uh, build giant puppets and props and visuals for all kinds of actions. I teach people how to walk on stilts and invest in mass spectacle and theater and to actually provide, if you will, soundtracks and visualizations for some of the resistance movements here in the United States. And then I also work globally with a group called Beautiful Trouble. But I mean, for me, it's all about building people power uh, to make positive change, to challenge and transform these unjust, violent, extractive systems. And that's what I think of when I think about reflecting the times. We are in this place where we as artists have a potential to vision a better future, provide people hope in that vision, and put some words, some uh, language, some images to that vision that can inspire people and, and move people and support people in getting invested in that work and building their own capacity to make art. And I think that at this point in my artistic work, um, I'm extremely 
on the far end of community practice rather than, and I think this is a challenge for us artists where, and I think Amina reflected it uh, when she mentioned some of this, where we sit inside our small studios sometimes and just create art for ourselves and work through our own issues that hopefully do reflect in the bigger world. Um, however, if what we want to do is make change, there is a whole strategic framework around these things that we need to invest in with the help of frontline communities, those communities who are invested day to day doing this work. And those communities actually need the help from artists so that art or what I usually call cultural work, because it's not for me just painting and drawing and singing and dancing. It's how we do our work, how I do my trainings, how we invest in action on the ground, how we model the world that we do want. Um, so it's more of a cultural work framework so that the art and the, be the beauty of it is not just icing on the cake. It's not extra. It is in and of itself the work that we do, the art of facilitation, the art of community building, the art of creating things together. And I think all these things are really big challenges for us. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I work uh, with a group called Beautiful Trouble. We're a collection of activist, artists, organizers, educators globally dedicated to making revolution irresistible, which is from Tony Cade Bambara, a really wonderful author and um, director. And it's about innovation and being more effective and bringing our full selves to this work. I mean, there's nothing quite as powerful as incorporating our culture, our uh, existence on so many levels as the other artists have talked about into the work that we're doing and to stand up to this corporate homogenization that actually says that we don't matter as individuals, that we all have to be the same. Um, and this is a great way to mobilize people um, in, in a fun and wonderful way to take action together, um, building our communities power so that we can really make change. Um, and uh, I think um, for me, I'll just talk really quickly about some of the uh, artistic endeavors I'm involved with with community right now. Everything from working here in Washington, D.C. with groups called Spaces in Action and Shutdown D.C. to take on our government. In the, and I'm sure those of you following what happened in the United States over the last four years know we had very actively had to resist the coup. Um, that was attempted here, and we have to continue to hold our government accountable. We built a human-sized children's game recently and deployed it on the mall in front of the Capitol here. Uh, people might remember, I don't know if people played this game when children called Candyland, but we built a 20, uh, like 10, uh, I guess must have been about an eight meter by eight meter plat actual game played with life-size boards to talk about women's needs, women's rights, and children's needs, and supporting those who are on the front line and communities of color, the social support and healthcare needed. And I'll say just as a, a, a way to say more about how I got involved, I became an activist when uh, fighting nuclear weapons. And very quickly in the work against nuclear weapons, I recognized that we were investing so much in death and destruction while here on the earth now were so many people living who needed things right now in social services and education and healthcare and food. And so there was this great, um, a great connection and awakening in a lot of us who did work on anti-nuclear weapons uh, and transition to economic and racial justice because they're all connected. And it reminds me very clearly of another uh, um, artist, poet, Audre Lorde, who said, you know, we don't have single issue campaigns or single issue uh, fights or struggles because we don't lead single issue lives. And all of these things, whether you're working on uh, women's rights, you know, patriarchal institutions, capitalist systems, uh, environmental degradation, all of these extractive industries and all these extractive systemic practices are connected and are reflected in the work that we do as artists and the work that we do building power together. So um, one thing I'll say also about some of the work that I do with uh, Beautiful Trouble and I really encourage people to look at that free resource online because it talks about not just the tactics that we use because we, but the bigger picture of how we decide what will be effective at making change and building our power. So Beautiful Trouble starts with all the stories, all of the wonderful resistance work that we've done, some success, some failures, and then teases out of those stories, the principles, the theories, the tactics that then can be 
used in your own context. Um, we call it a pattern language for those of you who are thinking about how to access things so that think you can make it accessible in different ways, in different formats. That's an art, like I consider that an artistic or creative way to think about information and use this information. And um, we really uh, support everything from the creative activism that's happening right now in the streets of Myanmar to defending democracy uh, campaigns that are all over the world. And um, we take our creativity in our artwork, even to developing a card deck of strategic creative activism that can be used by people. Actually, there's one right here on my deck, on my desk. Um, and uh, we really encourage people to, to engage in this cultural work as um, we encourage people to think of the joy of resistance or resistance as joy and art as an integral way, art and culture as an integral way of claiming our power and working uh, out things together. So I really thank you all for being here. And thank you to our interpreters as well. <laughs> thank you so much, Nadine. Um, I just really love the the kind of energy that you bring each time, you know, the, unfortunately, the too few times that we've spoken. <laughs> um, but I really love this idea of in, in the work of bridging, it seems the this almost like facade of a disconnect between doing like resistance work and then cultural and, and art action. Um, I think there's definitely been, um, you know, in some organizations I've worked with, you know, in some organizations I've worked with, unfortunately, there seems to be this idea of like, oh, cultural work comes later, but actually I've always seen it and as I'm sure everyone here does, that it's actually should be at the forefront. And I definitely think what you said was really powerful about how the role of cultural producers and of artists is actually to tap into that political imagination and to exercise it, to provide images for future, to provide words for future, to reimagine what language and kind of how we relate to each other can look like. Um, so thank you so much. And I want to thank all of our uh, speakers and artists um, we're going to move on now to a discussion for 20 minutes, um, moderated by moi. Um, <laughs> so I'll go ahead, and this is to um, all of our artists who just spoke. Um, the first question. So I suppose just to shift gears a bit and to go back to, I think, the original root of an inspiration for this panel, um, to follow in line with Nina Simone's call, do you think her observations still hold true today? If we are to reflect on our times, how does this shape and or inform forms of our cultural production or what you create in your art? And what do our times look like in your writings, paintings, or visu visual and textual practices? Um, so um, I guess anyone who would like to, to, to start us off may go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, or you, you can uh, do the raise hand function, <laughs> if that's okay. I don't mind answering that question. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's a really great question. It's a really great, great quote. Um, in terms of, I think I'm going to just double down on the point I made before about um, going back into the past. And I think, you know, when I look at like Toby's practice, for example, you know, I, I feel like there is so much displacement that has happened as the result of colonialism, war. Um, you know, I, I feel like colonialism is war and war is colonialism. I feel like they're, they're so connected. And I think that there's been so much displacement and like also so much, much restriction on movement um, for people being able to go to the places that in, inspire them or that they're from or misinformation about the places that, that people are from, you know, um, I feel like there's so much kind of oppressive violence um, in the world that I really like the idea of people of colour being able to, specifically I'm talking about people of colour here, um, being able to go into the past and also into the future. I feel like all of us, and I, and I will, I'll actually go back and correct myself there, I don't think that's right, because I think that everybody needs to go back into the past. We all need to be able to time travel. Um, if you think about the kind of romantic poets um, and, and so much of the work that was made in the, in, in, in the 17th century, um, that's kind of inspired by 
nature and how beautiful nature is in, in the UK. Um, and a lot of those poets were, were writing about that because of the enclosure of, of common lands, because the government, because the, 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 the people who had money were, were taking away lands that would have been accessible to everyone. Everyone would have been able to farm, everyone would have been able to fish. And you see just knock on right after that, the same thing happening through colonization um of the rest of the world so i do think that actually decolonizing is something that we all need to do no matter where we're from i think we all need to kind of go back and and start to heal um and start to challenge these um power structures which have which have informed our kind of collective capitalist land grabbing um unsustainable greedy way of thinking um so yeah, I think, and obviously, I think that like I do think we should reflect the times, and I think that it's fantastic if if artists are able to use their art to talk about where they are now. But I also feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna push for like an extension of that, a kind of Sankofaism. There's an artist called Barbie Asante who's doing a lot of research into the the Ghanaian Adinkra symbol called Sankofa, which means reaching into the past to bring something into the present um and i feel like yeah reflecting the present should come with holding space for the past and also creating a path into the future and i think you asked me what what um that looks like in my practice uh or you said what does that look like for us in our practice um and i think that's too much of a big question i feel like my, my practice is very like sporadic and if people would are interested they should follow me on instagram um and and find out what i'm up to um but i can't really answer it in a non waffling way so i'll just stop there <laughs> thank you so much jacob um amina i believe your hand was raised next yeah hi um thanks um Zona. um yeah i'm just gonna echo what jacob said for but from a logistic point of view that i've seen happen in my practice but also around me and um for me I always think about the past as accurately retelling history and it's not about what we've been taught but what's what we have not been taught and finding the gaps in that history um and and definitely there's a process of healing understanding but also ex there's an excitement because you know and, and i can only t talk from a pers personal perspective when i started producing broken biscuits and finding out about my granddad's mi migration story and this was not long ago this was only in the 70s i remember saying to my mom do you have any papers do you have i need this for my r d my research and development and she was like mm, what do you need it for there's no need and that for me was shocking because it's the value and our attitude towards history and I think we need to begin there. We need to restart and say, your history is valuable. I know that you have been conditioned. So, you know, throughout school, you there's nothing that looks like you, whether it's in books and storybooks, and but we have to restart. And, and, and one way that I've noticed in my very early career is that I forgot to create work for my community. And when I looked at my audience, which I'm very appreciative to my audience, who are non-Yemeni, um, I also realized the way I, was, the way I was producing and delivering work was not for my Yemeni community, but yet that was always my intention, why I began writing and, and discovering and creating. So I think what happened within lockdown is I definitely did shape and format my work. And I said, well, the first thing I need to do is translate my work in Arabic, you know, accessibility. And um, second thing is, why am I um, creating, why am I taking the Yemeni people outside of their community where they feel safe to go into a place that they don't know when I can bring the art to them? And that's what we did. We brought the camera to them, to the shopkeepers where they spoke freely in their own spaces. So I think for me, I can't say I've done so massively where I have really kind of like 
thought about this so much but in especially in lockdown with limited resources it has made me think about how can I start shaping my work not around the time what things are happening now but how can I basically bring social impact throughout my community to value their history to to view themselves differently with the attitude of value appreciation and celebration but also to be able to feel safe to talk about also the harsh realities one thing started to wing it out but one thing i found out when i did the documentary was that a lot of the yemeni elders were talking about their experience in toxic riots in liverpool and i'd never ever heard about the yemeni experience of shopkeepers of toxic riots at the time because it was never really portrayed and that is not to blame anyone it was just more of no one was there to tell that story and um, so we have a lot a lot of work to do um and um, I'm speaking this for myself, but yeah, it's a work in progress. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, I'll hand it off to Nadine, I believe, who had her hand up next. Thank you, Sarana. Yeah, I, I'll just um, second, as we mentioned, the importance of storytelling. I like, like sometimes when we talk about history or even use the word history or case studies or uh, people are feeling too overwhelmed. And when you approach it more as storytelling, people are much more likely to engage in it. Uh, you know, uh, just to talk about the importance of semantics and the choice of words, history is really important for me as a half first generation uh, American as well. Uh, all of these stories that I've had to dig out about my family have been fascinating. And sometimes generationally, people do not want to tell around their histories for any number of reasons imagined and real around security and uh, guilt and uh, change and fear. So um, I really do encourage people to uh, embrace the cultural and artistic value of storytelling and then to be able to tease out as appropriate for your context, like what are the lessons and things we can carry forward with us from those important pieces and how does it impact us today and does it have messages and, um, you know, a trail of what we might use in the, uh, you know, ideas of what we could do now or build on them. Because uh, as Jacob said, and as so many people have said, if we don't know, know our own history, we're bound to repeat it, including the problematic pieces uh, generally. Um, and I just wanted also to talk about as an artist, one of the things that I find is really important to do these days, uh, reflecting the times, I we haven't mentioned climate change yet, but a lot of the work that I do is with groups, particularly youth, indigenous youth, frontline youth, Native American youth, on climate change issues here in the United States, fighting new pipelines, fighting extractive industries. And um, there is often a disconnect between the work that we want to do and the material choices or the way we choose to work. So um, even now I'm engaged in potentially building a giant uh, prop, a, a, a hundred meter black snake to uh, visually represent a giant pipeline that we're trying to uh, uh, stop from going online, line three, and of course the Dakota Access Pipeline, which I'm sure people have heard about. And so thinking about what are the material choices that we use even to produce this kind of image? Can we get away from using petroleum-based products? Can we make a choice to use recycled and non-toxic things or things that can be recycled? How do we stop in reinvesting in the same firms and companies that are killing us and dumping on particularly impacted communities, which in the United States are usually communities of color and low income communities who can least afford the impacts of pollution and assault. So like, how do we actually integrate that into our practice? And also it's a very big challenge, especially for artists who, um, number one, think, okay, I can say this because I'm a puppeteer, like I'm gonna make this giant puppet and it's gonna solve everything. But unless it's within a strategic framework, that puppet may not deliver anything for the campaign that we're working on, right? And the question is, why are you building this? Who are you demanding change of? How does this build power? It's okay to say, well, it's a community building event. It's a good for outreach. It will bring people in. It will allow young and old to work together. It will, uh, the, it, those things are all legitimate things to do. And we should just be very clear about why we choose to do certain things. If what we're doing is trying to stop an arms shipment, however, then what we need to do is actually disrupt the arms shipment or put in place 
uh, changes that will disrupt the arms shipments, let's say, at a regulatory level. So there's some really hard questions to ask about that. And just one last thing I'll share about a project that is um, in our beautiful Trouble Incubator, if you will. It's called the, Cl the Climate Clock. And it is a project that mixes uh, art and culture and um, technology to bring the one could argue the most important number in the world to everybody's awareness, which is the number of uh, the time we have left in theory until we pass the point of no return on climate um, and carbon emissions. And so that is climateclock.world. And you can see it's a community building event. People are building these clocks all over the world from famous uh, people and artists to school kids in their own classrooms to try and mobilize people to take action and influence what their governments do. So it's a whole cultural artistic framework in the digital and uh, real world uh, to target a wide spectrum of people who could take action on climate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nadine. Um, I'll move to Toby now. Thank you. Um, I was really interested by this question of an artist reflecting their times. And it's not something I really thought about, I'd say, until like a year ago. Um, during like the beginning of the coronavirus, and there was a lot of grants for artists and um, to kind of speak about what it's like to make work in relation to like COVID-19 and I was like does that mean I have to like paint like a virus I was just very like confused about what that meant for me um but I've been thinking about it more recently and I was kind of thinking what type of person can reflect the times and there and I kind of thought there isn't like a collective way we can do that but for me I felt personally that my experience of the world, I kind of take in the world, I ruminate on it and create art and act as a kind of um, a transformer in a way of my experience to create the art. So in that way, I felt like that was how I would reflect the times by, you know, just taking in the world. And my art was a, um, there was a word I use, I can't remember it right now. Uh, my art was kind of a translation of my experience. And it's not like a direct, um, like painting of like, like I said, something that's happening right now in 2020. But it's like the people who've spoken to me, the conversations I've had, um, the books I've read, the images I flick through in my family albums. And that's how I personally um, reflect the times as an artist. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, I believe Jacob um, had their hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that because it just came to my head that I think, you know, one thing that I maybe didn't say is that the thing that connects my practice together, all elements of my practice is a kind of stance against alienation. And, and I think that um, whether it's alienation from the land that we're standing on, alienations from our own bodies, alienation from our histories, um, and the government is trying to push through a law at the moment, which effectively is starting a genocide on um, traveler people. Um, it, you know, it's you can call it a cultural genocide, but the, uh, because the the government is trying to remove these people from their homes, um, but really they're travelers. So they're, 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 we're at the end of a of a massive pandemic. This is a group of people who are already like. In terms of education, like um, there's this rid ridiculous narrative that white working class boys do the worst out of all um, ethnic minority uh, racial groups in schools. That is not true. Um, uh, that's only true if you really twist what working class means. And let me not go off on a tangent about that. But traveller communities are really struggling in loads of ways. In terms of ways, in terms of the work I do in education, um, children from traveller communities are definitely the most disadvantaged in the country, um, and we've just had a pandemic this is a group that are already really vulnerable to remove them from their homes now is essentially a genocide i'm sorry it is um and i think that um when we talk about anti-colonialism what we're talking about sorry i'm speaking so quickly for the bsl interpreter i will slow down um when we talk about um anti-colonial struggles i feel like for me traveler people um traveler communities 
are kind of the last bastion of like um of 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 of, of people from from europe or like in in the uk anyway that are really like resisting this idea that this this, this displacement um and i think we really need to rally behind um traveler communities right now and and amplify their voices um and and see their struggle as part of the anti-colonial struggle i'm not really articulating what i mean very well um and also keep talking quickly sorry um but yeah i think my work is about anti-alienation and whether that's from your own voice from your own body from your land and when we're talking about land we need to stop these people being kicked out onto the street right now because it, it's evil um yeah and that's all i'll say no, thank you all for that. And thank you, Jacob, for, um, for I think, recentering traveler people in especially the space, but also as a reminder in anti-colonial practices. Um, I think there's this thing I've definitely been seeing, and I think it's become even more hyper um, uh, kind of visualized, is, is the very visceral practices of displacement in the UK. Um, especially in a pandemic, I think regardless of of where we sit on displacement, it's a collective like that is that should never be happening. Um, but especially seeing places such as Elephant and Castle being being essentially like torn through um, Seven Sisters or even like um, estates in in Hackney and people who are living there just not being re rehoused in any way and. I think especially that we're discussing, um, you know, this Nina's, you know, um, call on reflecting on the times and how that can be incorporated into our practices. It's like, who do we center in these practices? How do we then, how do we, this was something that Amina had pointed to is how do we meet our audiences? How do we meet the people that we create for halfway? How do we bring them the very things that we're making? Um, obviously, I wish we could go on one on this, but I think we have about 20 minutes left. So, um, but hopefully this can be part of ongoing conversations off, off screen. Um, I'll go ahead. We have about six minutes left for this before I open it up for Q&A, but I do see here people already sent in Q&A. Um, so if you got, if y'all would like, I can, you're more than welcome to answer this question. Or we can move on to the on to Q and A. So it's so so it's up to you as as the speakers. Yeah. Um, so this question. Oh, sorry. Did someone say something? Yeah, sorry. I was just gonna just to say a statement is um, a lot of people forget that no matter how why we create art, when we deliver it to the world, it's it's a it's creating a historical moment. So when people are writing in academia or you know art is just another way of delivery. So it's like, you know, when we, stu when we studied male war poets and we learned about war from the trenches, you know, that was a historical moment because we saw it from another point of view. So to anyone who, in the audience who's creating art and not doubting their value and their voice is to understand that you are part of our history. So when you deliver it to the world, you're making a mark and um, you're part of this movement, whether it reaches millions of people or whether it, it reaches a few people around your circle. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, I just had a flick through the Q&A and there's some really amazing questions um, So, if, from the audience. So if it's okay, if we can just move on to the Q&A because I'd love for us to, um, for you all to be able to engage with them. Um, the first question I have here, um, this is a really good one. Um, to all or any panelists, how difficult or possible has it been, has it been to make the anti-racist decolonizing art, art and work you do and still earn a living? Is there a compromise that feels okay asking as someone, gra as someone grappling with this um, question myself? Um, I think that brings home a lot of things and about the limits of materiality. So anyone who would like to start us off. I'm happy to start off it. Um, yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, so I've been, a, I, and I think, um, so I've been a practicing artist whose work is centered around these issues for almost a decade. 
um and um and yeah i've had to do a million other jobs to to get to a point where um i now can support myself off my artwork um and i think that i think i'm really lucky like someone messaged me the other day an old friend and said the fact that you are able to make a living off like doing work that is political is 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 really amazing and i was like oh shit yeah sorry to swear but i thought wow that that is actually kind of odd um so I, I but it's only because i've you know i've had certain privileges i'm from a working class single parent background but my mum i still had a room at my mum's house so when i've uh you know when things didn't work out you know and i had to to move back in with my mum for a couple of months like that's a huge privilege um and i don't think that people should be ashamed of like needing to stay with their families if they can um to save money um you know i don't think there's I think realistically also art, every artist that I know um, has had to juggle many jobs and have wear many hats um, to be able to um, to to do the thing that they want to do. And I'll just make a last point, which is that if you want to get good at doing anti-racist work or, or, or work that is, is, is queer or is aligned with activism, a lot of it's going to have to be for free um, because you, you can't be paid all the time for those things. And obviously, eventually now I, I'm in a position where I'm able to do projects which are funded well. Um, but a lot of the work that I did in the first five, six years um, and still, if I can, if, if it's like squat related projects or resistance, um, but obviously you have to eat. Um, so, you know, I think at the beginning, if you if the, the thing that I would always recommend to people is volunteer with organizations that you think are amazing um, and volunteering is really good because if you do like an intern or something then you're kind of stuck and you have to do whatever they tell you and <laughs> which you sometimes can't physically do because you have to like pay your bills you know um, I think volunteering is a really useful thing to do because it means you're able to give what you actually can give um, and 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 not end up burning out really early um, and, and running out of, of um, money to pay your rent Thank you, Jacob. Um, Toby, Nadine, Amina, if any of you would like to contribute to this question. You want to go, Amina? Go ahead. No, no, no. Go on, Nadine. It's, it's, it's uh, I, I will second a lot of what Jacob said. Um, I find I have, I don't think I could ever say I've made my living as an artist. But I feel that as a woman, as an educator, as an activist, as an artist, all of these are underpaid, undervalued professions. End of story, period. And I'm a, I'm a single mom myself. There's just no way that this current extractive system, this capitalist system, whatever words you want to use, will actually give any of those, any of those categories what they're due in the value of our our, our world. And so it's um, one of the things that I, try, I strive for and that we work a lot on with Beautiful Trouble is actually a sustainability picture. So we approach it from that way, like how do we provide people what they need to be activists, artists, educators, trainers for the long, long haul? And how can we take care of each other? And some of that is obviously, I mean, I live in a house that's a group house. Like it's not a one, it's a one family house where multiple people live in different rooms in the house, right? We share, it's more of a community. We think of it as more of a community setting or communal setting. There's uh, choices that I have made and that other people that I know have made in order to be able to do the work that we want to do, the calling that we feel, however it is. And um, as an activist, as an artist, as an educator, as a single parent, there's, um, I, I often think about why didn't I pick a job that would make me a bazillion dollars an hour, or a lot of money, a lot of, uh, you know, euros an hour, and then I could do what I wanted on my free time, but that doesn't fit with my psyche or with my commitment to not working for the extractive industries when at, whenever possible and for not working for the system that needs changing. And so um, I think, Having uh, principles and beliefs that you share with the people that you work with is really important in moving forward together in an anti-racist, feminist, ecologically sane way. And I wish I could tell you something different about you could make a million dollars by 
uh, investing in a nifty or whatever it is these days <laughs> online. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Nadine. Um, Toby and Amina, if you would like to contribute, feel free to, to unmute. Um, if not, I can move on to another question from an audience member. I'll just answer this in a few lines. Um, and I just want to say, um, when I said before about planning strategically, and I'm saying this from a poetic aspect, okay, and in terms of an audience, yes, I do feel like sometimes we do have to compromise, but do our values compromise? for me for myself now um i think that will just break me apart if i were to compromise my values um however when i talk about compromising the biz the business model of how i work is allowed because i feel like the issue and i can only speak for myself because i've been freelancer since i was 17 is i realized we wow. sometimes see ourselves as a business model but however we do the same thing we market ourselves we do the funding we do the admin we do so really we do all like the foundation of what a company does but on a smaller scale but this is just from a personal perspective but what i will say in planning strategically okay um when i went to name my name my play broken biscuits the play is not about broken biscuits it's about racism, it's about Islamophobia, it's about the British Empire. But I said to myself, how can I get my work to an audience that I know will not be comfortable with this with these topics? I said, well, what's one thing that we have in common between Yemeni people, news agents, and the British people in the 70s, which was broken biscuits? So sometimes what I do strategically is I, from a, a literature point of view, I come in very subtle very shy, very reserved. And I bring these hot topics in the middle of these poems because at the end of the day, no audience is going to run away and say, I feel uncomfortable, I need to get out, or this is too much, you know? And what I'm trying to say is I manipulate the, the art. And I think I'm allowed to do that because at the end of the day, what I'm saying might not, we might not like it, but I know it, there's truth in it because it's about people's lives, people's history being missing, people's lives being killed. It's about this idea of living in fear. It's about, you know, the idea of why is it that the grooming of the right wing party is sympathized with then radicalized Muslim people is, you know, deported, you know? And I know that's up to conversation, but, you know, you see a lot of right wing, um, young boys who are being sympathized and they're being let go and not even given the full the full sentence and for me that's a question of who's this democracy for so i think i'm allowed to manipulate am i am i allowed to manipulate my art to make it sound like it's something else when it's not <laughs> i mean that's my business model um but it's, it's meant to be a secret but i've let it out into the world <laughs> <laughs> Um, can we all do this <laughs> I think yeah, exactly <laughs> thank you so much for that amina i think that what that question really points to as well and i think it's been present in every single thing like thing every artist here has said so far which is feeling that tension between wanting to live in a world creating these things to bring a world where we don't have to work where creating these things isn't so we can earn a living rather it's how do we bring the future here whilst also balancing the fact that we do need food on the table as jacob was saying and and that's where a lot of really ugly things come into play especially i think with quote unquote the art industry with a big a where everything becomes commodified um an extraction that's present in very real ways such as home displacements um is kind of refashioned to then consume cultural production. Um, so yes, it's the arms industry is also very well known to be heavily linked with the arts industry. So um, yeah, but that's again, that's a different conversation for a different time. Um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask, we have about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to ask one last question. And, and Toby had agreed that um, she, she wanted to, to move on, by the way, just so um, people don't think we're just skipping over Toby. Um, um, and then we'll have closing remarks. So um, this question is from an audience member. Do you all agree that art and drama should be an integral part of school curriculums to educate on history and current affairs? Have any of the panelists 
had the opportunity to engage with education departments. And I think I personally really like this because um, in the last year we've seen such a huge push in, um, against decolonizing curriculums. Um, some, if I'm not mistaken, some MPs even censored it to Soviet style censorship, which obviously is a very then inaccurate reading of historical realities. Um, but then as well, this very strong, heavy handed way of attempting to criminalize um, teaching about anti-capitalism. Yet at the same time, if that's going to hold true, why is it still legal to teach about fascism in some ways? But, you know, um, those are the kinds of lines of thinking from this current government. But if any of our artists would like to have a go at this. I don't mind going since no one else has j jumped forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I'm, I'm currently on a scholarship. I just started a PhD um, at Westminster, um, which is literally the, the focus of my PhD is to look at the education which has been excluded from schools, specifically like black led arts education in the UK. Um, and the, the, one of the focuses of, of my research is to look at the types of education work which has not been allowed to be assimilated into mainstream education um, and and think about why that is and there's so much I could say about I mean part of me is like abolish mainstream schools <laughs> but obviously when I say abolish I don't I think schools are a really fantastic space where really radical amazing conversations can happen and also there's no alternative at the moment like to school really it's the safest place for young people to be but i have so many um gripes with um the way that it's set up and and what its function is i'm really lucky to have worked with loads of schools in the past um but working with them has made me realize how, how systemically racist they are um and and ableist and classist and, and all the rest of it and I'll just quickly, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking so fast. Um, I'll just quickly say that um, one of the things that I'm trying to organize at the moment with a group that I am part of called CARE, which stands for the Coalition of Anti-Racist Educators, um, is to try and organize a conference for youth-led um, groups. So there are lots of children who are in school who are, have started their own anti-racist campaigns um, in different ways and I think it's really important that they connect to each other and that they speak and they empower each other um, because a lot of the language that is used um, as was mentioned is around indoctrination as, as if schools aren't already inherently political spaces um, as if um, young people aren't capable of forming their own political opinions I know I know of, I know a few organizations, well when I say organizations, just groups of children in school who've formed their own groups um, doing anti-racist work. So if anybody knows of any groups of young people um, who've started their own groups in schools to challenge racism, it'd be great if you could pass that on to, um, to me or to CARE. Um, on, on Twitter, it's the Coalition of Anti-Racist Educators, and, and I'll, I'll put that in the, in the chat. But I think it's really important that we get past this idea that talking that children talking about politics is children being indoctrinated children are very capable of forming their own opinions um, and i think it's important that we kind of support them to know that their opinions are are correct often they're right in the in the things that they notice in terms of inequality um, so yeah um, that's all i'll say on that and i'll put the coalition of anti-racist educators in the chat Thanks so much, Jacob. I'll definitely be contacting you about that. Um, and I'll move on to Toby and then Nadine. And we just have a six minute time check left. Thank you. And it was really great to hear about um, Jacob's work and I'll definitely look into care. Um, I actually co-founded a collective whilst I was at my final year of university um, as a fine art painting student called Platform Black. And it was basically what the name says. And we kind of wanted to highlight um, people, artists that look like us. And I was one of only two black artists in my year. And my friend and I created this event and we invited three um, black women artists to come and speak about their work at my university and um, kind of hold space 
in what was a very like white colonial curriculum. Um, yeah, we just wanted to decolonize our curriculum. So we founded that collective. And since then, actually, we've been able to work with my university on similar events. And we've been able to provide um, students, black students with crits, um, with professional artists who are also black, which is something that we never had in university. Um, and a crit is basically like a space to speak with other people about your work. And usually a crit space can be quite difficult with um, other students because they might alienate you or they might avoid really obvious topics in the work because they don't want to talk about a certain thing. Um, yeah, so that's the work I do with Platform Black and we um, highlight the work of black creatives and kind of we aim to kind of transform the institution in that way. Thank you so much, Toby. That's incredibly inspiring. And um, I hope that we can get a link to, to that platform in the chat as well. So we can, there it is, excellent. Um, and Nadine, thank you. Yeah, this is all really exciting. And um, some of the, I just wanted to share some other ways of thinking about it. It's so important. I think a lot of our education is stuck in our head and disconnected from our actual gut or somatic or our feelings. And so a lot of the work that we do with that's possible with art and culture is to actually move our understanding out of just simply the intellectual into our butt into our bodies right our hearts our gut our, our reflective um, spaces and it's one of the powers of the work that we do and I think we should as artists we feel it and we should own it and use it um, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, particularly uh, the work I do her individually and the work that beautiful trouble does is based on what we call both experiential education and popular education. And that's a real term for an actual focus that's different than what is typically done in university or you know, primary schools, which is what we call the banking method, where a person, usually a white man, stands at the front of the room and deposits their knowledge into the people who are in the classroom, the banking method. We are actually not big, uh, proponents of that. In fact, what we encourage is people to come into the space knowing that everyone is a learner and everyone is a teacher and we are going to um, value and uh, involve all of the experiences and skills and knowledge that come into the space with us. And that's the essence of popular education, starting where we are and with what we know and who we are culturally, and then building an analysis from that, figuring out what we need to learn and share together, and then moving through that. And um, that is a really powerful, there are really powerful tools around uh, all of that kind of education and learning uh, that uh, are valuable. And in the United States, there's a whole bunch of uh, work like Platform Black and CARE and all, and a great program with lots of resources called Rethinking Schools that might be useful for people as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I feel like this could go on for hours, but unfortunately, I think Kat has other plans. <laughs> um, I want to thank first off each of our speakers, Jacob, Toby, Amina, and Nadine. I want to thank Kat for inviting us for the space. I want to thank our BSL translators, um, our graphic um, visual note taker, um, and everyone who's been holding on the chat, um, and especially to everyone here who's attended this event and for your questions. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but please hold tight and hopefully we can meet again. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. This is the end. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye everyone. Thanks so much, Sarona. Yeah. Thank you all.